Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to this week's episode. Uh, we have Jack Gorst here again. Thank you very much for joining me, Jack. And we're here to talk about the Misano test. Uh, unfortunately, we couldn't uh, make it happen sooner because we were both busy on different days. So <laughs> yeah. that's like the only free day we got this week. So thank you very much for being here again. And uh, you was at the track live in uh, Misano again, right? Yeah, I was. Yeah, cheers for having me on again. Um, yeah, it was at uh, Mazzano, and as we know, it was a fairly interesting one, should we say? Uh, yeah. Obviously, the the big topics, and even like the whole Mazzano weekend, um, we all know the the stuff around Mark Marquez, and I think everyone was changing their mind about every five minutes with whether he was going, staying, whatever. Um, it's been a bit chaos, should we say, the last week or so. Before we start with the actual test, what did you make out of the race and especially like Peko and Bezeki racing injured going onto the podium, Dani Pedrosa and P4 and all this madness that happened there in different ways? What did you make out of it? Yeah, obviously the races weren't exactly uh, classics, were they? Um, I think Jorge Martin was, he had like a little step on everyone all weekend. But as you say about Bezeki and, and Banyaya riding injured, like... I mean, to be honest, I don't, even in my fantasy team, I took Bezeki out because I thought that after 10, 11, 12 laps, he would start to really suffer because he said that his, before the weekend, his hand was like really sore. Um, and even like Peko, Peko was unbelievable, wasn't he? Um, it was kind of weird, like from the first practice, like I went down to pit lane and got a video of him walking onto the bike um, just to put on stories. And like he was obviously like really, really struggling. And then you saw him on the Sunday when he was just walking over to the grid after probably going back to the garage for a quick chat with his engineers before the race. And like he was walking better than he was on the Thursday after doing how many laps in Mazzano. So, um, yeah, obviously the races at the front weren't that amazing. Uh, but Danny Pedrosa obviously added the main highlight of the weekend, didn't he? Um, I think it just shows... Well, obviously, we all know how class Danny is, but also it shows that when he retired at the end of 18, um, yeah, I think really he wasn't done. He was just kind of done with maybe where he was, you know, kind of he probably more than anything needed a change rather than retire. But also, you know, if he wanted to retire back then, he wanted to retire. He made the made the right choice. So, But yeah, in incredibly impressive anyway. Yeah, we had uh, a discussion if uh, Danny Pedrosa was just born in the wrong era and we never really appreciated him because he was racing against Stona, Rossi, Lorenzo, Marquez and couldn't really shine. And if he was racing in today's era, if he was like 10 years younger, he would smoke everybody. So what's your take on this? Um, obviously, if he was 10 years younger, he'd be going and winning races. But also if he's 10 years younger, like, I mean, what are we? 2013 was obviously when Mark first came in and Danny... Danny missed out on the 2012 championship, didn't he? Because he had a, a big crash. Um, yeah, I mean, if he was 10 years ago and he was riding like how he was 10 years ago, in today's field, obviously, he'd be right at the front fighting for race wins. But I don't think you can take away or underestimate just how good the guys at the front are. Obviously, like, if Pekka or Bezeki were 100%, they would have been quicker and faster than what they were. Uh, and for them to be that fast anyway, like, particularly around Mazzano with both of their injuries like Bezeki with his hand was it I can't remember now if it's left hand or right hand but anyway there's a lot of direction changes like he's always pulling on the bike um it's going to be pretty painful and like you know he's going to have to just kind of bite the leather band and really go for it and the same with Pekka you use your legs more than your arms to ride a MotoGP bike or to ride any sort of bike so the fact that he was doing it with a knee that literally got run over by a 157 kilo KTM like four, five, six days before and it's uh, pretty impressive but no, obviously Danny if he was racing nowadays in his prime, like in his kind of late 20s to kind of 30 years old for sure, he'd be, he'd be fighting for a championship Yeah, and that's you You said something very interesting what I was about to say, like Peko has a leg injury so usually you ride the motorcycle a lot with your legs and your hips and uh, try to turn it he had to change it a lot to riding more with his arms and i would assume with marco bezek it's quite the opposite when you have a hand injury i don't know exactly what hand hand injury it is and what uh, kind of limitations it uh, provides for him 
but uh, it has to be very different like use more of your lower body more than you even do before and try to uh, put as less as, as less pressure on the hand as you uh, can do so yeah exactly like that both of them would have had to adapt their yeah. style and the way they ride i think bears like obviously with his hand it's maybe not so bad uh in some corners than others obviously you put a lot more pressure on your inside hand when you're leaning left compared to if you're leaning right and say your left hand's injured you won't put so much pressure on there but the big thing with him i imagine was where it was really hurt and was breaking when it's putting all that force through the the palm of your hand and into your wrist and obviously your forearm and all that i imagine there he's he was probably having to squeeze a little bit harder with his legs i'm sure his his ass and his and his legs were a bit sore more than usual after uh, after the weekend but um yeah impressive anyway very impressive yeah and mark did actually very very well when you compare him to the other hondas he was like 23 seconds uh, ahead yeah. of the next best honda <clears throat> and uh, joan mir really really took a shit this weekend i mean it was horrendous and which brings us like to the first topic and the big topic of the test honda and Mark said they have a new bike. It's completely different. You have to ride it completely different. But the fundamental problems remain the same. So what do you know about the new bike? And maybe we can categorize a little bit into chassis, engine, aero. And yeah. so um, in, terms of the, in terms of the new bike, um, mainly the things that, uh, well, the biggest change is the chassis. Uh, it's Honda's, what is it, fourth sh different chassis this year, and then obviously the Calyx one. So there's been five different chassis this year. So they've obviously been working hard, at, at least anyway. Um, but yeah, the biggest difference is the chassis. And it's like, okay, it's different. You know, the, there's some kind of creases in different areas. The, the main weld on the main beam is at a different angle to the rest of the chassis we've seen this year which can make a bigger difference than you, you might think. Um, but there's still like classic design elements that are so clearly Honda, like the kind of shapes of it and the thicknesses of it around like the swing arm pivot area. They're all fairly similar. Like they're obviously a little bit different. Um, and the other thing with the chassis is you never know what it's like on the inside. So the biggest thing was the chassis. They did actually incorporate one like design element from the Calyx chassis that was actually quite a lot different to what Honda usually do up around the headstock. So they like up around the headstock where the air intake comes through the center and then straight into the air box behind the chassis in the, the main part of the bike. Um, usually Honda around there have like quite a lot of material. Um, but then on the Calyx one, there was a lot less material around there. Uh, and they all said about the Calyx one was that initially they felt it gave a little bit better fr front feeling. Um, so they kind of taken that and translated it onto this new chassis. Um, but then when the riders said about this new chassis, they were like, first thing was that they said you have to ride it in a different way, but it doesn't really limit any of the problems. Um, or it, it did limit some of the problems a little bit, actually, Joanne said. Uh, but Taka and Mark both said it was just, okay, it may be very different. You have to ride it in a different way, but the, the problems are the same. Um, actually, Joanne said that it, he felt better on used tyres with it. It could be more consistent. Um, and he said something else. I can't remember what he said now, um, whether it was to do with the front feeling or the rear grip, whatever. But regardless, anyway, the the big problems still remain. They still have a lack of rear grip. They still don't have very good front feeling and they still have a lack of turning. So, I mean, literally, there's a major problem in every area there. So, um, by any means this chassis is not the the key to making honda suddenly better i remember we talked about the calyx chassis uh, at the beginning of the season when there was this rumor going on if calyx built a chassis for honda and yeah what we both kind of said is that it could be very possible that honda just trying to get a different point of view like They have their way of thinking about a motorcycle and Calyx obviously has a different way of thinking about it. So it's not necessarily that Honda just uh, outsource their chassis department to Calyx, but more like get a different idea and a different point of view to maybe solve their problems. And I think uh, when you have this first, uh, this first version of the chassis or like an early version of the chassis, um, they're trying to use for next year, they will develop it and maybe uh, sort out the 
the front feeling issues they have. And with the rear grip issue, it um, brings me back to the podcast with uh, Simon I did when mm -hmm. he said an engineer told him that uh, 80% of your rear grip comes from your engine. And as far as I'm concerned, Honda didn't bring in new engines. So that's like a very, very exciting possibility for Honda when you take into consideration that they might be able to get concession next year where they yeah. are free to develop the engine. So I think this is a very, very interesting uh, point we, are, we have to mention because rear grip apparently comes more or less from your engine and they didn't bring a new engine. So, Yeah, um, I, to be fair, I spoke about this a lot with Simon over the weekend uh, and we do actually think there was a new engine. At least like Mark uh, did tell us over the San Marino GP that there was a new engine update. He didn't say if they had it here or not. But at the test, they didn't try it. Mark, Shawad, and Taka, the regular riders, didn't try it. Simon thought when he was listening to one of Bradle's bikes uh, on the Monday morning warm-up in pit lane, he, he thought that he could hear a slight difference. And I have to say, like, when I went down, I could, you know, I also thought, oh, it just sounds maybe slightly different. But then you never know if that's, like, the whole placebo effect and we're just kind of, you know, spinning our own heads around and, and creating something that isn't there. Um But regardless, anyway, there was no new engine for the regular riders to try. Um, and yet, at least Sai believes, well, many people believe, including me, that if Honda did change their engine to something which is more like Ducati, KTM, Aprilia, the other V4s, um, then, I mean, there's that old saying of like, if they're all doing something, then why aren't we? Because the Honda is the last bike left, which sounds significantly different. KTM changed their engine this year. They changed it to a bit more of a deeper tone. They changed the firing order on it, we believe. Um, and at least from that, we know that uh, it may not have necessarily been faster like or better top speed or better acceleration or whatever, but it allowed them to be more consistent and have better connection at the rear. Um, and if you get that, like it's, it's gold dust. So uh, you kind of wonder like what Honda why they keep using this style of engine. Of course, we don't know if in the background they are developing something to bring to Valencia at the end of the year. They might be, and then we're all just chatting shit. But um, for now, at least anyway, their engine is the last one that sounds significantly different, and they're the only ones that are suffering this much with a lack of grip. I mean, there is this perception of Honda that they are quite stubborn with their stuff. So... All I have to do, uh, everything has to do, uh, has to be in house. That's why the Calyx uh, thing was such a big uh, headline. And also, I've heard that Alberto Puig came to Honda with a list of engineers they should hire. And Honda said basically, no, uh, we will do it <laughs> our own with our own engineers. So, yeah, Honda can be quite tricky in this sense. So, um, it doesn't surprise me. But at the end of the day, it's such bad advertising what they're doing at the moment that they have to get out of their own way and develop an engine, especially if they get concessions. Like this would be yeah. gold for Honda to develop an engine, which is more rideable because Honda is the only uh, bike that gets like on throttle high sides at regularly. So um, that's a big problem alongside with the electronics. That's like the basic thing what Simon uh, nailed it down to electronics and uh that they are quite stubborn in many departments. So uh, let it say aero, chassis, engine, whatsoever, on is stubborn. And I think that if they actually get out of their own way, that they can really take this chance of maybe getting concessions. So uh, it's a very, very interesting uh, couple of months ahead of us until the 24 season starts to see what Honda is doing because uh, also, I've seen or read that uh, they lowered the bike and uh, made it longer to uh, make it more like a modern MotoGP bike, which is low, long, and doesn't turn so well, but has enormous braking stability and enormous acceleration. And that's the way you go fast at the moment. Yeah, about the longer and lower thing. I don't know if they did or not. I mean, that wasn't like confirmed by Honda or anything. I did. I saw the same comments. A lot of people online... They saw the photos um, uh, taken and, and kind of just said, oh, it looks longer and lower. I don't know if it is. Um, one thing that was different, uh, there's a couple of photos on our 
MotoGP Tech Group on Facebook. You can go have a look. They're taken by me, so um, you can go have a look at them. There's they said about the riding position on the new bike was was a bit different, and like they had to get used to it, and then that caused this whole like kind of different riding style. There's like a spacer that sits under the top of the triple clamp, so right in the cockpit between the handlebars. Uh, it was a lot taller, so the top triple clamp could sit a lot higher. And then you notice as well that the handlebars were wedged right underneath that top triple clamp. So I think the handlebars were in a much higher position than what they usually are, um, which then opens up a different range of possibilities of riding position and stuff like that. So I don't know if the bike was longer or lower. It might have been, but and then maybe that's why they raised the the handlebar position and the top triple clamp with that taller spacer. So that could be, it, there could be some truth to it. But to be honest, to me, it looks pretty, pretty similar. It didn't look like it was any longer and didn't look any lower. I would like to talk to you about the most boring topic in MotoGP, but I feel like we have to do it. Electronics. <laughs> do you even know if Hana made some progress with the electronics? Can we even see it from the outside? Do they talk about it? What's like the whole problem? Because it seems to be such a big problem in uh, World Superbike and uh, MotoGP because apparently they have more or less the same electronic system and rule sets, so they're more or less doing the same there. And um, it seems like Honda is so far behind there. Are they making progress there? Do we even know about it? Um, I'm sure they're making progress. Like... Uh... You would like to think so. If they're not, then um, yeah, then it's it's not going well. Uh, obviously, for anyone that doesn't know too much about the electronics of MotoGP, it's all like a spec hardware, spec software, um, magnetic reality ECUs. It was brought in in was it 2016, something like that. It was essentially to stop big factories developing their own uh, software and using that, like Honda used to. And Honda's software used to be amazing it was the nuts and it was why they were so so good um or a large large part of the reason why they were so so good uh there's always been this kind of thing and it's the same with yamaha as well like people always say about oh yamaha they haven't quite figured out electronics um and one big thing is like if you listen to a lot of the ktm stuff this year and why ktm have made such a big improvement uh is because they've kind of stolen some of ducati's secrets with various engineers coming across obviously jack miller And his crew chief, who was ex-Ducati, with him at Ducati, Christian Pupilin. And they've just applied some of the electronic strategies there. Um, and it's you would always kind of think, uh, if they all have the spec software, the same software across all the bikes, like surely they're all doing the same stuff. But even though it's spec software, it's still incredibly complicated and detailed. So there's always like more than, you know, uh, more than one way to go about the job and produce the same end result. So um sure it, it could be a, a big thing that honda are just doing something fundamentally wrong with the electronics or fundamentally different um but this is again why maybe alberto Puig wants to hire some of the engineers to come in and say oh that's weird you know we do it this way let's try it and see if it works yeah simon basically uh told me that the the software is basically still in the hands of the engineers of the electronics but the hardware where the software is run through is spec so yeah. you have like a frame <clears throat> but how you can maneuver inside the frame however you want so and ducati apparently has so much uh, progress there that nobody else is trying as even close to them except like kdm who hired all the electronic uh, engineers and funny enough i was um i was cleaning the house today And uh, my girlfriend's very sensible on, task of you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> my girlfriend's at the university today, so uh, I took the free uh, the free day to make the laundry and uh, clean the kitchen and all yeah. of this stuff. And I was listening to the Motorsport Republica podcast, uh, and it's a great podcast to listen to. And they have like a guest on. I forgot his name, some Australian dude. And they were talking about Jack Miller leaving uh, Ducati for KTM. Mm -hmm. And in my opinion. Letting Jack Miller go was, from our point of view now, a big mistake. Not because Jack Miller is better than Inea Bastianini or better than Jorge Martin or whatsoever, but he took so many engineers with him. And because of this move, I would, I would assume if Jack Miller stayed with Ducati, a lot of the Ducati engineers would stay with him. 
and uh, KTM wouldn't be as good as they are now. So from this point of view, I think the loss of Jack Miller is very, very uh, big for Ducati, not because Jack Miller is the next champion. Like yeah. Jack was the number one rider, that's clear. And yeah. I would argue that Jorge Martin and Bezeki and uh, Inea Bastianini are better riders than Jack Miller is. But the whole package Ducati had last year with the engineers, with the way the team was set up, where there was a clear number one, clear number two. I remember us discussing about Inea Bastianini and... Uh, and um, Peko after the Portugal test before mm -hmm. everything with injuries went yeah. down. So I think in this regard, it was a huge mistake to let him go because now KTM closed the gap with the electronics so much because they had all the Ducati guys. And I think the way to go for Honda and Yamaha would be uh, to do the same, like hire some engineers who know what they're doing with the electronics and get out of the way of figuring everything out by yourself. Yeah. I mean, it's it's the best way to uh, invest in information is to go and pinch someone from the team that is doing it the best right now. Like, it's the same in all motorsport. It's the same in all other sports. Like, it doesn't matter what sport you're doing. Um, I, I mean, we talk about, let's use motocross for an example. There's a, a very, very successful trainer, one of the most famous in the world, called Alden Baker, who actually used to be Nicky Hayden's personal trainer um, in 2006 when he won his championship. Alden Baker has this like whole setup in motocross and supercross where he's trained champions for years and years. He's worked with uh, Ryan Dungey, he's worked with Ryan Villapoto, all these like massive motocross champions. And so many people go and join Alden's program and they join Alden's program because they know it works. Um, and it's the same kind of thing as you know, a MotoGP engineer is pinching information from someone else. They look at, a motocross racer looks at, you know, say back when it was Ryan Villapoto and he was winning his four Supercross championships in a row. And someone's like, oh, shit, I want a piece of that action, so I'm going to go join Alden's program. And they do the same. Uh, and for some it works, for some it doesn't. But for MotoGP in that sense, obviously you know that if you take an engineer with all the knowledge and expertise of that current winning motorcycle you absolutely have the tools to then apply it to yours it's just you have to allow that person to be able to input their ideas um, and that is if honda do manage to secure some big name engineers that's what they're going to have to do because you, you talk about you know whether honda is stubborn and and all this sort of stuff i think it's a lot of it is like pride in their own work which you can't fault them on honda are the biggest motorcycle racing manufacturer on the planet and the most successful um so obviously there's always going to be that kind of like you know they've got to swallow the pride type thing and be like shit we're right now we're not the best we have to actually listen to someone else so you hope that if they do manage to do that um they just let them not give them free reign because of course you can't give anyone full free reign but that they listen to them take their ideas on board and really allow them to take those ideas and run with them especially when it comes to something like electronics or the engine because when you see it, a ducati bike you can more or less when you have a smart uh, couple of engineers you can more or less understand what they're doing in the aero department or what they're doing like with ride heights and what they're doing with uh, bike length and all of this stuff you know that's quite easy to understand but it's not easy to understand what they're doing in the electronics department because no. you can't see it. With the engine, you can maybe hear it and you can maybe, if you have a good rider, and that's what John Zarco uh, is for Honda, hopefully, like a good rider who can bring in a lot of information yeah. and maybe some Ducati engineers with him. Who knows? We'll see. We'll see. I, and, but at, at the minute, it sounds like he's not going to take his crew chief. Okay. It sounds like that. So maybe Ducati have learned something with Jack. Because <laughs> this is the other thing with Jack. Obviously, Jack gets a lot of shit because he sometimes has bad races and crashes. But Jack is unbelievable with feel on a motorcycle. Apparently, anyone that's ever worked with him has said this This guy just, he's not certainly not the sharpest tool in the box, but he really, really knows when you make a change exactly how it helps and how it makes the bike worse. Because he was supposedly the one that really kicked on with KTM about this new engine this year. The other riders couldn't really see the benefit of it because it wasn't quicker and it wasn't accelerating faster. But Jack went, no, hang on a minute. Like, it allows you to do it easier. So we have to go with this engine. 
Yeah. Sorry, derailed you there. <laughs> yeah, so basically what I was trying to say is you have to have people in there who understand how things work. And yeah, like I said, aerodynamics, you can copy it. It's quite easy, like easy. But uh, with the electronics, you have to have people who know what they're doing with the engine, especially if Honda is still using like a traditional Screamer engine. And uh, somebody like Joan Zarco comes in who knows how a Big Bang should feel and how it behaves on the Ducati, that he can bring in a lot of new ideas. And if they, I mean, they paid him a shit ton of money, apparently, so they should listen to him. If not, it's stupid. <laughs> and um, yeah, with Joan Mir, they still have a rider who wrote the Suzuki and... We still don't know what happens with Mark, but uh, it, I've, <laughs> I think it's a good balance to have riders like Mark and Tucker who know Honda, but then have riders like Joan Mir and uh, Joan Zaku, riders who know different manufacturers who are in itself totally different on the way uh, they succeed. But if they can listen to it, and that's, I feel like that's the most important thing, listen to it. Yeah, for sure. Um, and I'll touch on Taka as well, because obviously, Taka is like a lot of people question why Taka is still there, but Taka does a good job. And also, crucially, he speaks the language and can directly communicate with the HRC engineers. And obviously, that's something that the European factories don't have to contend with. Generally, everyone in Ducati or, Yam or um, Aprilia or KTM speaks a good level of English. So it can be straight across the broad there. It doesn't really matter who your riders are as long as there's that understanding of English, but with the HRC engineers and Yamaha's engineers, it really helps when you have that that one rider that locks in and can speak the language. The last thing about the new Honda bike I would like to ask you, they introduced a new set of Aero, which looks a lot like Ducati. And uh, what are the benefits of the Aero and are they using like a ground effect thing? What's this thing on the side? Because it looks like some sort of ground effect thing but then on the other side it looks like they don't fully commit to it like ducati and ktm and aprilia are doing so yeah. do you know what's going on in the aero department with honda i mean obviously that new aero um first appeared after the summer break um and then the this 24 bike that was seen in Mazzano also had it fitted um honda have said well, the, the riders have said that Honda believe this is the way to go now with this high downforce aero. And obviously, if you look at Ducati, KTM, uh, and Aprilia, like it, it obviously does appear to be that way. Um, I, I did see a tweet from someone who obviously understood a lot more about aerodynamics, like the mathematics of it, than I did. Uh, and they actually analysed the Honda aero, and they seemed to think it was quite good. Because um, you look at it, and obviously, it's like these massive, big, bulbous wings and like the leading edge of it is quite thick rather than like clean cutting through the air but apparently that's quite a good attribute to have um so in terms of that obviously they're going for this high downforce thing um uh and you can see like when the riders first started using it uh like mark in austria kept you know getting a bit squirrely on the brakes and loose at the rear um and one thing that ducati have mastered is having this massive aero on the front to help them stop and accelerate and all this sort of stuff, but still keep that rear wheel on the ground and use the rear slick to help them brake because it's so crucial to have that kind of back torque of, of the engine brake pulling you backwards in that braking zone to get stopped. And so many times in Austria, particularly down at turn four, you saw Mark get on the brakes, the front end would dive and then it would kick up at the rear and it would just be a mess and he'd go into the gravel. Um, they definitely seem like they've made some progress in that. It looks a bit more controlled on the brakes over the last couple of races. Obviously, still far from ideal. Um, but at least they're learning. Like, you know, any new aero package you bolt on, the first time you go and ride it, it's going to be a bit like, oh, shit, okay, I don't need to brake that hard or, or we need to adjust this to help. Um, it's, uh, away from, obviously, the, the main downforce wings, there's those side fairings, these ground effect side fairings. They're a little bit different, as you say. Like they don't seem like they've gone full out like what KTM, Ducati, and Aprilia have. Um, the the most complex one by far, and the most complete one is Aprilia's. Aprilia's really seem to have kind of found some small bits where they can really fine tune how that works and the effect it has. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
Um, and Hondas, yeah, like firstly, the the part of the fairing that actually sticks out doesn't really stick out that far. Like there's only a little bit. And then even in that main pane of the fairing where uh, it would be connected or at least very close to the ground when it leans over, I think they have like a small exhaust vent there for the radiator for the air to come out. Um, which is different to the rest. You know, they all have quite a smooth fairing with no holes, no exhaust vents, nothing. Um, so you wonder, like, again, why is it different? Um, so there's a little bit of confusion, shall we say, as to what have Honda either found by doing it? Because obviously they've made it for a reason. They haven't just made it to look like the rest. Like, they're going to have done it for some sort of reason. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um hopefully it's not that that reason <laughs> but, uh we'll see really uh, i mean in terms of the aero like i'm no aerodynamicist uh but you can look at it and you can think um okay ducati honda uh ducati ktm aprilia do it like this why are honda not doing it like this so and um, whether it will have the same effect as ducati and the rest of the guys it doesn't seem like it the thing with the braking, what you said about the rear tire, brings us back to engine and electronics again. Because yeah. I remember Simon, after he wrote the Ducati, he said the way the rear wheel is managed by the electronics on the braking is so incredible and it's so smooth yeah. that uh, you don't get a lot of the disturbance during braking. So it pr has a pretty high stability. Uh, so that again shows us how things are working together on a motorcycle like you can have the best aero package but if the engine isn't working and the electronic isn't working then it doesn't uh, have any benefit to have good downforce at the front so i think with the new engine that will uh, solve a lot of these problems at least i hope so and um yeah with the electronics we talked about this but do you think with the new aero package honda has a better front feeling uh phew. Hard to know. Um, I mean, what they will have is more load on the front. Um, and Honda have constantly said that we're struggling from a lack of feeling. And at, at times they've said a total lack of feeling with the front. Um, so it's tricky. I mean, you have to make the comparison in that with Yamaha as well. Because Fabio after, or at least during 21, and then particularly 22, and now especially in 2023, um has always said that he's on the limit with the front and he's having like a just feels like on the limit so at least he has some feeling but it's not a very nice feeling um then if you strap more aero onto the front and if you're already on the limit with the front then it's going to put more pressure on the front and surely it's it's not going to feel any better it's going to feel worse the question is whether Honda's bike actually is on the limit or not with the front end. Um, obviously, we've seen them have a few front end crashes this year, uh, but mainly their problems are rear end slides and crashes, you would say. Um, so I don't know. It's it's tricky to say if they have a better feeling with the front because, for one, every time you talk to a Honda rider, they just say they have no feeling, regardless of if it's with the big arrow or with the lower arrow. So I think before they do that they have to figure out what they're they're doing with one their chassis uh, and two maybe their engine as well yeah i'm quite uh, interested to see because honda has really nothing to lose and so much to gain and this brings us to like the last honda topic about mark marquez <laughs> um basically nobody do, uh, knows anything uh what I've heard is that he has the option to go to Grisini and like there were even speculations about him buying the team which yeah, yeah. apparently isn't uh, realistic because I don't think uh, Grisini will sell that's like the whole point of it of my argument because they have uh, been close closely linked with Aprilia for so long and now finally got their own independent team back and now uh, to sell it after two years is... And two successful unlikely. years as well. Yes, especially, yeah, yeah. since they're, they're yeah. having success. I don't know what their financial status would be. That could be a reason to sell, yeah. even if they don't want to. But um, I have no idea. But I've heard that uh, Honda 
Oh nein, not Hauler. Mark could take his sponsors with him to Grisini, like Repsol, like Estrella Galicia, like uh, Red Bull. That could be uh, interesting, but I've also heard that those sponsors want him to stay at Honda and uh, not go to Ducati and write out his contract. So, um, yeah, with all of the speculations, obviously you're not in Mark's camp, I'm not in Mark's <laughs> camp, we don't know. Yeah. But I would like to hear what's your guess there. Um, so all weekend in Mizano when, you know, you saw uh, articles coming out from really, really credible sources and credible journalists in the paddock saying that yeah this Grissini deal with Mark is on like it seems like it's going to happen uh I, I wasn't convinced like all weekend it just seems odd to me why Mark well obviously the reason why Mark would leave is because he'd go and have a better bike and there's the added benefit where he joined his brother so it's like you know you see He's kind of going into this kind of family team almost. So there's a lot of benefit for the situation for Mark. What we know about Mark Marquez is, one, he's very, very loyal. Like, he's a Honda till he dies, man, really. Like, he's always backed Honda. The good times, the bad, he's still backing Honda. Obviously, now it seems like there is genuine options on the table with him saying during the test that he has option A, B, and C. Obviously, didn't state what those options are, but we'll see. And even, you know, we might even find out next weekend in India. We'll, we'll see. But yeah, like, I, I wasn't convinced all weekend until he said that at the test about that he has option A, B, and C. Then for, like, maybe six hours, I was convinced. And then Tuesday morning, I was back to being like, nah, I don't think he's going to leave. Um, he's very loyal. And it just, I can't wrap my head around Mark Marquez being in a fourth-rate Ducati team. Like, it just doesn't seem, it doesn't compute for me. It doesn't seem possible. And, like, whether that's just me being a bloody idiot, like, of course Mark would go to a better bike, regardless of whether it's a fourth-rate Ducati team. It just, I don't know, it just doesn't line up. Um, it's one of those ones where it almost kind of leaves me speechless because I just don't know what to think about it. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it, it would be a sensational move. Like, if, if Mark went to Ducati... You know, regardless of whether it's a year old Ducati, of course, you go and fight for the championship. Um, many people, and that's another topic there, like, you know, would he win the championship on a Ducati straight away? Of course, he has every chance to go and do it. Uh, and I think you have to put Mark down as the favourite, regardless of, you know, if Peko's a two-time champion, just because Mark Marquez is Mark Marquez. But I do think that Mark and many people would be surprised at just how good Pekka is and how much of a hard time he'd have beaten him over a season yes I also don't really believe the Grisini thing for more or less the same reason I always thought Pramak Pramak has a free spot Pramak has uh, is a satellite team and apparently in Mark's contract there's a clause yeah. that he can't go to a different factory team I don't know how you could argue that Pramac is still a factory team because he gets the GP24. If Honda says no, you can't go to Pramac. Maybe yeah. there's some discussion behind closed doors. I could definitely see this. But um, yeah, more or less the same. I think Mark is very proud of what he accomplished. And I think he's obsessed with the ninth and maybe tenth title because I think he won he can't retire with eight titles when Vale has nine. I think that's <laughs> he's a madman in this sense. Yeah. So um I could definitely see him going to a Ducati where he thinks he uh he can win, even if it's not the factory bike, but I think he mm -hmm. still wants the GP twenty four. And that brings us to uh, Paolo Ciabatti saying there will only be four and those four bikes will be factory and Pramac. So Bizeki won't get one. Yeah. And I still question the value Mark Marcus brings to Ducati. Because yeah. Ducati has a very unique situation by themselves. They have Bizeki, they have Jorge Martin, who are both more or less challenging for a title here. They have Inea Bastianini, who has a very unlucky season. Mm -hmm. And they have Peko Bagnaia, who's the clear-cut number one. Do you really want to uh, put like a fifth alpha male uh, in this mix and potentially ruin the balance you have? Where there's already questions regarding next year's factory bike. They said Inea will stay before 
Barcelona, but then Barcelona happens and in here fucked up big time. And now Jorge Martin is winning uh, two races and I think he wants to have a factory seat. And within Ducati, I feel like they can change whatever they want. Like if they want to put uh, Jorge Martin on a factory bike and Inea on the Pramac, they could do this because they're mm -hmm. both contracted by Ducati and not with Pramac. And uh, with Bezeki, he wanted to stay with um, with Valle, so I think this is safe. But after 24, if he has another successful season, and arguably the GP23 is a lot better than the GP22 he's riding at the moment, so w especially with the GP22 engine, um, we talked about this a lot after Malaysia, I think there's also a lot of potential there where the balance inside Ducati could go sideways really quickly with those four riders and then put Mark Marcus into the mix. I still don't know if I would do it if I'm Ducati because I have nothing to gain but everything to lose. Yeah. What's the point? I mean, Peko will probably win next year's championship as well. And yeah. if he doesn't, Jorge Martin, uh, Enea Bastianini or, um, or... Marco Bezeki, that's the fourth, I forgot for a second, will win. I mean, it's highly unlikely Peco, uh, Pedro will come in and win the championship uh, at first. So I yeah. think uh, Ducati has everything to lose, but nothing really to gain here. And that's why what I would uh, think if I'm Ducati, like, what's the benefit of signing Mark? Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. Yeah, I, I don't think, for one, they, they don't need him. And they've said that Mark Marquez isn't in our interest at the minute. Obviously, the Pramac seat is that is controlled by Ducati. Ducati have the say over the riders. Grassini seat is... Grassini have the say. So there's... Obviously there, there's a bit more speculation. If you're Grassini, like, you're lapping this up because it's amazing PR for Grassini Racing. The fact that they could even be associated seriously with taking on Marc Marquez. Like, it's just massive validation for the team. Um, but yeah, I, I entirely agree. If Ducati, like, say this was at the end of 2019, um, you know, and for a third year in a row, Dovi had been beaten by Mark or whatever. And, well, let's say at the end of 2019, Mark and Honda were in this shit situation then. And Ducati hadn't won yet. Of course, then Ducati would be much more interested in taking Mark Marquez because they hadn't won yet. But they're winning now. They don't need him. They have Pecco, who's a phenomenal rider and, like, bizarrely underrated as well. Um And then, you know, Jorge Martin is doing pretty well now. He's more consistent than he ever was before. Still needs to find a little bit to go and fight for a title, I think. But, I mean, he's right there. Then Marco Bezzecchi, Enea Bassinini when he's fit <clears throat> and gets used to the new bike, is going to be winning races. Absolutely. So it's like, yeah, why would you risk kind of alienating one of them or all of them to take Marc Marquez? Yeah. Also, Simon had a very interesting point. If Mark leaves Honda, then this could spiral down into Honda leaving MotoGP. And does Ducati really want to have MotoGP without Honda? Because his point basically was for you to win something, whatever it is, it's a better feeling if you win it against good competition. Yeah. And Honda being in MotoGP no matter the status of Honda at the moment, but Honda is a big brand. And if you beat Honda, that's something, you know? And if there's a world where we only have KTM, Ducati, and Aprilia and MotoGP, all of a sudden, it's not the same feeling anymore. Yeah. So this is something Simon brought up, and it's a very interesting point to think about. Yeah, I mean, I agree. Like, obviously, if you win against the best, it feels so much better. Um, yeah. I... I You know, I'd like to think I'm a bit of a Honda fanboy anyway. Like my dad always worked for Honda and stuff. So I'm not necessarily a Repsol Honda fanboy, but I love hey, HRC. So, um, yeah, I don't think Honda would ever leave, even like regardless of how bad it gets. I mean, I think it would have to get even worse than now for Honda to really leave. <clears throat> you know, there's that whole classic phrase that obviously, you know, without racing, there is no Honda. Sorry, excuse me. <coughs> Um, but, you know, okay, say if it does get even worse, you know, Mark Marquez does leave. And next year we have, I mean, who are you going to have on the, the factory bike next year? Joan Mir and Joan Zarco or maybe Ike Lokona comes in from World Superbike. Like, 
if that I happens, think... Honda will be pretty anonymous next year, yeah. unless the bike is significantly better. And that is a disaster for them. Yeah. I think it would be Jean Zarco. Um, if I was Honda, I wouldn't put Ikari yeah. Kona on there. So. No. Like, you just wouldn't be able to. So, yeah, short and simple, what do you think uh, will happen with Mark? Will he stay or will he go? Uh, he stays. Okay. Yeah. And regarding KTM, we talked a little mm -hmm. bit about KTM. There's this big thing with the carbon fiber chassis. And I would like to like mix Aprilia and KTM into one there because there have been those rumors for Aprilia for a long time that they're bringing a carbon fiber chassis. And it's particularly interesting because you can do so much with carbon fiber. But then again, Ducati failed miserably doing this during like the Valentino Rossi era where he went uh, to Ducati and then Gigi Dalinia uh, came in 2014 and basically built the whole project there. So uh, it's quite interesting if they are going down the same path and maybe ruining all the progress they have or in the last 10 years they have learned so much uh, about carbon fiber and all of this stuff and maybe even learned from Ducati's mistake even though Aprilia and KTM weren't yeah. in MotoGP at the time that they can actually pull it off and they may be like a, a, a switch in the power balance you know or a change in the power balance where with the carbon fiber chassis you can do so much and yeah what do you know about Apulia's and KTM's carbon fiber chassis what are they trying what are the benefits what are maybe the disadvantages and um, well for Aprilia not so much because we thought we were going to see it there at the test but it actually wasn't there um, it wasn't no didn't uh, Zavatori test it in uh, Australia uh, in Austria I'm sorry uh, I'm not sure don't don't because know. I've heard rumors about it, but thinking about it, I'm not quite sure as well. But I'm, I was quite certain that we were going to see it uh, in well, Milano. I mean, I didn't see it. To be honest, I didn't spend too much time down Aprilia's garage. Um, I know they did test a chassis, but it wasn't a, uh, it wasn't a carbon fiber one. They tested like a, a chassis for 2024, supposedly. Okay. <clears throat> and both Aleish and Miguel used it when Miguel rode the 23 bike. Apparently, I had this new chassis as well. Uh, yeah, the, the carbon thing, I think, as you say, like 10 years ago, whatever, like they've learned so much since then that, that for sure, like what they couldn't get to work then, they will make work now. And um, also, it's really important to know that KTM are employing it in a very, very different way to what Ducati did back then. Ducati's bike back then was pretty unique because it, like the engine was a stressed member. So they had, before the carbon came along, they had like a, a steel trellis front chassis, um, which connected onto the front of the engine of the V4. Uh, and then onto the back of the V4, the swing arm, the carbon swing arm di bolted directly onto the engine as well. So really, really stiff. Like you had this short little chassis, then the engine, which is incredibly stiff, and then a carbon swing arm. So that old Ducati that was like kind of from the stoner era, like 07, 08, 09, uh, and even 10 and 11 when Rossi jumped on it, um, was very, very different to the way KTM are employing it now. How KTM are exactly doing it, we're not 100% sure. Um, from the outside of it, it's quite an interesting piece to look at because it looks as though, well, the main beam of it, so going up the sides, like the main expanse of the chassis, is all carbon and going up in around the headstock it's all carbon around there what we don't know is if the rest of it so like coming down towards the swing arm pivot we don't know if that's also carbon as well because when you look at it it looks as though they pinched an idea from uh some mountain bike technology we've seen recently there's a company called afton bikes um which were started by the afton brothers as well as um their sister who i've forgotten her name now uh, Rachel Afferton, who's like a legendary women's downhiller. I think she's the best ever. Uh, greatest full time. Anyway, regardless. Uh, the technology of that is they take carbon tubes and then they 3D print metal lugs. So these like bits that the carbon tubes go into and then they bomb the carbon tubes into these lugs. And so obviously the lugs are where you have like the bearings and all the different pivot points and stuff like that because 
then you don't put uh, compression onto the carbon, um, which is uh, a bit of a bad reference. But if you talk about uh, the submarine, I can't remember what it was, the one that went down to the Titanic, what was that called? The Titan sub. I know what you're talking about, uh, but the one with the billionaires in it, right? Yes, yeah. People say a lot of the reason why that failed is because the type of carbon they were doing there is great under uh, pressure, but being pushed from outside is when it has pressure on the on the outside going in, um, then it's where it fails. Anyway, regardless, the, the point is that in these mountain bikes, they don't put the bits where they're going to torque down bolts and screws onto the carbon, they put it onto metal. Um, so the thing how that translates to the KCM is it looks as though that piece where the swing arm bolts on is still metal. We don't know if it's like all carbon and it just has like a metal sleeve on it that just to protect it. So it, it you know, the, the swing arm tightens down onto metal or whatever, we don't know. But it seems as though it's a full carbon chassis. Uh, the benefits, one for sure is lighter, particularly in KTM's case because they were using steel. Uh, their steel chassis is quite minimal anyway. Like it's not, you know, loads and loads of tubes, whatever, but absolutely for the same expanse of metal, like it has to cover the same areas, uh, the carbon chassis will undoubtedly be lighter. Um, not a big deal because obviously MotoGP bikes have to be 157 kilo max anyway. And I'm sure that KTM's is, you know, to that limit or some kilos below. So it doesn't really matter. Uh, but the big thing is with carbon is once you have the mold for something, you can take that mold and then produce infinite different versions of it, keeping that same mold. So once you have something that fundamentally works, you know, with the actual kind of physical layout of it, and you're happy with that, you can then go and fine tune that every day if you wanted to. You can layer up a different carbon chassis and have some spots that are thicker, some that include different weaves that like you can do whatever you want there. So it's essentially really customizable and probably once you've done the cost of creating the molds and stuff which is very expensive which is why a lot of people don't or a lot of factories haven't explored carbon so much until now um once you've done that and you're fronted that cost and you're happy with what you have then you can go and fine tune it infinitely essentially and much quicker than you could with a traditional aluminium chassis um so there's lots of benefits obviously then there will be cons uh as you say the cost of producing a carbon chassis is going to be higher um it's a new technology not not a new technology but it's new in the in the world of racing motorbikes you know uh so they're going to have to find out like what layering works the best for which characteristics they want from it but i mean out of the box like pedroza ran it all weekend and finished fourth in both races in the most competitive MotoGP field we've ever had so it clearly works um so yeah it's quite a interesting piece yeah uh quite a cool thing i may sound stupid but i actually don't know are formula one cars kind of do they have a frame like a motorcycle i don't they... know shit about formula one so <laughs> please please excuse me but do they even have like a frame because the th the thought i'm having right now ktm and red bull are closely linked and there were a lot of talks about uh, Red Bull aerodynamics coming over from Formula One to help, help KTM and MotoGP. So the thought here, if indeed there is like a similar concept, which is working for Red Bull and Formula One, and they have like a lot of knowledge there, why not just transfer this uh, knowledge yeah. to KTM? Like, is this possible? Is this, or is this like totally, to to two totally different worlds? No, that's a great point, actually. I hadn't thought about that. Maybe this is where this idea has come from. Um, yeah, really good point. Uh, in Formula One, at least from what I understand, they have like a carbon monocoque, uh, which is essentially like your, your chassis or your frame. Um, and then everything bolts onto it. So like onto the carbon monocoque, the engine bolts on and et cetera, et cetera. Um, so yeah, they would have a lot more experience this the people from Red Bull Advanced Technologies, which obviously work for the more F1 side, they'd have a lot more experience with like structural carbon components, I guess. So yeah, it could well be that this frame is as a result of collaboration between, you know, MotoGP KTM engineers and the Red Bull Advanced Technology F1 engineers. Yeah, good point. Interesting. 
And uh, did KTM bring anything particularly new to Danny Pedrosa's bike except like this carbon frame? Uh, no, it was just that frame by the looks of it, at least anyway. Uh, I'm sure behind the scenes there's a lot more other pieces and probably, you know, on the bike there was maybe some things that we didn't notice. But the only other thing was <clears throat> Danny had a different uh, top triple clamp. Um so just in between the, the handlebars for anyone that's not too sure or too familiar. Uh, and that was actually carbon as well, um, which is usually, well, well, all the time anyway, you see those uh, aluminium pieces. Um, and the carbon one that KTM had was incredibly thin. Um, so, yeah, that's obviously, again, you know, the same vein as this carbon chassis. They've also made this carbon triple clamp. Regarding uh, carbon there, I've read something on Twitter that there's uh, the problem like quick story time my dad always uh, told me to never buy a carbon road bike not because <laughs> they are not good or anything that's not the point he said if you crash this thing once you risk that there's uh, that this thing breaks and you can throw away your 5000 euro road bike and it's yeah. not worth it for an everyday man like if you ride to do the France okay cool do it but uh, for you to just do it as a hobby, no point. And I read a tweet which kind of referred into the same um, into the same direction. Where what do you do if you crash your bike and the carbon like there's like a small fraction in the carbon frame or whatsoever? Do you have to change the whole frame? Can you even do this during a live MotoGP session? I mean, to change a whole frame on a bike, no. But then this is why they have two bikes. Um, yeah, good point. If you crash it and it it gets a crack, like, uh, I mean, for one, it can be hard to see cracks in carbon, um, and particularly in KTM's case, because uh, I don't know whether they painted it orange or whether it was just like a, a sticker, like a vinyl that they put on it, but it was covered anyway, so you couldn't see the carbon. Um, yeah, good point. Uh, I mean, I know there's all sorts of like fancy technology that uh, F1 uses. I think even F1 uses like ultrasound technology. So the same thing that they use for scanning when a, a woman's pregnant, uh, they can use that to detect. I think I might be trying to shy here, but I'm pretty sure I've seen that before. Uh, this ultrasound technology to check carbon frames. You should also be able to x-ray it, right? I guess you can do the same. Yeah. 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 Because you can definitely x-ray steel to see if uh, when you weld something together, if the the welding thing is uh, stable or not, you can x-ray it. So uh, I could assume that you do the same with carbon and like have like a big x-ray machine where you put the bike in or like the frame, <laughs> strip it down and put the frame in and it says, okay, it's good or not. <laughs> So yeah, obviously maybe. the thing with that is whether it's actually realistic to have that at a racetrack. So that's the trouble. I mean, it's a, a multifunctional system because if you have like a Barcelona incident, you can just put Paco in there. <laughs> and so, you know, if he's good to go or not. Yeah, maybe they can charge the teams for an x-ray yeah. for their rider. <laughs> but KTM is going away from the steel frame like what they always did and uh, is um, trying to change to a carbon or is it like a hybrid thing or what's Yeah, that? I mean, whether they're going away from it or not, that will be to be seen, you know, like we'll see what they use next year. Because at the same test on Monday in Mizano, they did also have an updated or a small update to their uh, steel chassis. Um, Brad actually said that like there was positive and negatives to both. You know, both had good, good attributes that were different to others uh, to the other. So, uh, yeah, I guess it's one of those things where okay, it's nice to have the carbon chassis, which weighs a little bit less, but the weight isn't an issue. So, um, I guess whichever one they they feel better on. But yeah, yeah, it will be interesting because as you say, like KTM have always been steel. They've made steel work in every discipline, and they're just starting now. To make the steel work in MotoGP as well and yeah. then all of a sudden they go to carbon fiber i mean you could just paint it orange and nobody would actually know except they're listening ah, to this podcast S S so, simon would know simon would figure it yeah, out yeah. no but <laughs> like the the public 
isn't as balls deep into MotoGP technologies no, as no, you and no. me and Simon are. So yeah, yeah. it's and like your, the few your nerds. Fan. Yeah, yeah. The few nerds know, but the the every man just sees. Oh, it's the same frame as on the Duke. It must work. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, but um, where was I going? I had a thought. Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> ah yeah with the weight um like the model gp bikes now are 157 kilos like without fuel and oil and all of this stuff like right uh, i believe so yeah yeah so when you build a bike uh, with a carbon frame and let's say it's five kilos lighter does it provide any advantage to have a lighter bike and then put some extra weight on there and maybe um, to reduce the center of gravity more towards the road or is, is there something you can do where this may provide an extra benefit even though um, the bike doesn't weigh less? Yeah, uh, there's definitely, yeah, there's something to be explored there for sure. Like if you have a, a limit with, uh, or sorry, uh, like a little bit of wiggle room with the limit, with the weight limit, um, absolutely like it's something to be explored there with, not necessarily attaching ballast because you, you never want to add weight needlessly onto your motorcycle. But then maybe you could, I mean, like we know that Ducati has a mass damper in the, in the tail unit of the bike, you know, if it was beneficial to have those weights a little bit heavier or something like that. And obviously that would add weight. It wouldn't add a massive amount because you wouldn't change it drastically by kilos. It would be by a couple grams. But again, like it's, you know, maybe, you are not entirely happy with your weight dis weight distribution of your bike and you find that oh, okay if we have like a couple of hundred grams more on the rear it helps us with braking and keeping the rear tire on the ground so for sure it would give them like a little bit of wiggle room to then go and explore some some other things so we may be looking at a future where model gp bikes weigh less than 100 kilos and uh, <laughs> <laughs> then they're putting just plates from the gym uh, onto onto the bottom yeah and like a free bike with 300 horsepower yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this would be hilarious but um everything else with ktm more or less is the same or have they brought any new um, um, any new error updates new engine no nah, no nah, more or less the same we believe um i can't remember off the top of my head if they said they had a an engine update or not but i don't think they did um so yeah more or less the same for now it's um the big one will be obviously valencia valencia test where we yeah. see the the proper first step at 24. yeah it's the next test then right there's yeah. no test in between and um with aprilia there i remember we talked about the new engine uh, after the portimao test mm -hmm. because uh, aprilia funnily enough they developed a new engine didn't bring it to the test, but now they're running it without ever testing it before, like with Aleish and, and Vinales on the official MotoGP test. Uh, obviously, Lorenzo Zavadori did, but um, they're now running this 23 engine, which they didn't test in Portugal. And we were speculating a little bit about if it's better, if it has any risks to run a to run a engine you didn't previously test it. So what's the engine state right now with Aprilia and what's the thing they're planning for 24? Did they bring a new engine to Misano? Um, in terms of for 24, I don't think they did bring a new engine to Misano. I think that all Aprilia did uh, in Misano on the Monday was uh, test a slightly different chassis, uh, aluminium one. Um, but yeah, the, as we spoke about months and months ago, the 23 engine, they didn't test or didn't ride on the racetrack until the, the first round uh but paulo bonora was saying you know like it's absolutely no problem we've done loads and loads of miles on the dyno and it's only a small uh evolution compared to before like it's nothing crazy different uh, and yeah it obviously turned out that way because the, the new engine that they are using is fine uh we've seen that Aprilia have probably a little bit better top end this year but the biggest thing is actually Aprilia have really improved their rear grip uh, and like drive grip out of corners like now we see and even like last year it was the same you go to a low grip track and Aprilia are the ones that are really really strong um and yeah it's the same story this year like we saw them get that one two in Catalonia low grip track um your track that's really tough on tires and there was when Aleish made his move or like a couple of laps before when he was making his move on Peco 
I forget if it was the sprint or the um or the Grand Prix. But no, it was definitely the sprint because Pekka was in the hospital during Oh yeah, yeah, true. Sorry. <laughs> that much has happened, I forgot about that. Uh for the sprint coming out of the final corner, Aleish was unbelievable with the, the drive he would get compared to the Ducati. And it was like the first time you went, fuck me, like the Ducati actually has an area where it's not as good as as someone else as a different bike. Um so for sure they've really improved their their rear grip this year. And that could be like as Simon said to you in, in the pod he did, like eighty percent of your grip comes from the engine. So it could be that a good chunk of that increase in their rear grip has come from the engine. But then that same rear grip didn't help them in Mizano because he had so much rear grip it was pushing the front a little bit. Um obviously Ralph Fernandez had his best weekend ever, so then he's maybe found a way around it, but it might have just been that Aleish really suffered in Mizano because of the way he rides a bike. That's actually something I heard about the um, the Boscoscuro in Moto2, that they have so much rear grip that on tracks which are high in grip, that they struggle to turn the bike because you can't turn the bike with the rear so well if the rear has too much grip. So there is actually too much grip on a motorcycle. Yeah. It's, it's a wild yeah, concept. Yeah, occasionally. But, it doesn't yeah, happen yeah. very lot. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, when, when you have a rider saying they've got too much rear grip, it's uh, usually quite a rare, <laughs> rare thing. <laughs> yeah. And um, I just realized we kind of forgot about Yamaha because Yamaha brought a new engine and Fabio wasn't particularly yeah. happy with it, like with the whole bike and with Yamaha. I recently watched Bruno 2020 and Brad Binder won the race and Frankie was leading the pack for yeah for quite a while in the beginning of the race and I realized this Yamaha kind of looks similar like from the aero package and Yamaha didn't really they developed something yes but they didn't really develop something that worked and those big high downforce packages they ran at the test and now they kind of went back and forth with the old one. So it's a rather strange uh, situation with Yamaha and the Arrow. And uh, the next thing with the engine, like Fabio was screaming more horsepower, more horsepower. Now he got more horsepower. And apparently it's not better. It's arguably worse. And uh, because they don't have any rear grip. And I remember Andrea Dovizioso saying, hey, you need more rear grip. You don't need more horsepower. But Fabio was yeah. so keen on more horsepower, which was maybe because he was young and didn't know any better. And somebody like Andrea Dovizioso, who has ridden a lot of bikes, just knows better. But um, then they hired this Aprilia guy. I can't remember his name. The engine uh, Mami engineer. Oni, said it? Could be. He worked in Formula One pre previously. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's and, I think it's that Marmioni, but I can't remember his okay. first name. Yeah, whatever, this guy. And um then he was brought in and kind of had a input into the twenty three engine, but now the twenty four engine is like the first engine he fully developed. So mm -hmm. I'm very interested in how is the rear grip uh, issue for Yamaha? Uh, and Fabio wasn't particularly happy uh, with the bike. So what do you know about Yamaha and especially with the engine? Um, so as you say, yeah, Fabio wasn't a fan of the engine, which was a weird one because before we got Fabio's quotes, we actually had <clears throat> an interview with uh, Maya Maragalli, the team boss. Uh, and he said that the new engine was faster and easier to ride. Uh, and so you're thinking, right, jackpot, uh, crack on, let's see what the riders are going to say. Um, so then when Fabio came in and was like, same attitude as what he was throughout the Mizano weekend, which is generally just like he's frustrated and a bit down, um, and saying that the engine wasn't any better or like he couldn't feel uh, a power increase or anything better, um, you're a bit like, well, you know, where's this comment come from, from Mayo? Like, has it come from what he's been told by the engineers and what he's been told maybe by Cal Crutchlow, uh, the test rider? So obviously the first time you're going to hop on an engine is the best time to take that impression of like, if it is a big difference or not. But also then with Mizano, like we don't know what this engine has been developed for, like if it's, if it's been developed to have better top end, uh, which if it's that case, then 
the Mezzano circuit isn't the best one to be able to figure that out because there aren't many real, really fast straights in Mezzano. They don't get up to those kind of 340, almost 350Ks an hour. Uh, but if you were also then trying to cater for the other complaint that Fabio has had this year, which is a lack of acceleration, then you would think Mazzano would be very, very good for that because there's lots of areas where you're accelerating from low speed. But again, like he didn't say, oh yeah, it felt better in acceleration. He just said he couldn't feel any difference. Um, and it's a bit of a worrying one, really, because now they obviously have to go to another track and test it. Um, but if it's not what they want and not what they need, um, then they're going to have to go back to the drawing board and tweak it again and see what else they can come up with. Um, on the other side of it, the chassis they had, Fabio didn't try. Frankie tried it, but Frankie, in typical Frankie style, I love Frankie's class, uh, but in typical Frankie style, he was just like, uh, yeah, I didn't prefer the feeling with the new chassis and just left it at that. Um, so, you know, pretty concrete review on that one. Um, and then what else did they try? Ah, yeah, the new aero. Uh, obviously, Fabio is always asking for more acceleration. And part of that is that he's always saying, because we have too much wheelie. So you reduce the wheelie by adding bigger wings. And then your problem is you're you know pushing too much air and it slows you down on the straights. So when he tried the new aero, he said, ah, oh, you know, uh, we weren't, we were slower with it and I didn't like the feeling on the bike. And then it comes back to the whole thing of like he's struggling with the front end and saying he's always on the limit at the front end. So they bolt bigger wings on and it creates more pressure on the front end. So surely it's not going to help. Um, so, yeah, I've, you know, you, you wonder. With Fabio, there's always this trend of like he tries something new and either he doesn't like it immediately or he says, oh, it's not better, not worse. We'll try it somewhere else. And then eventually he says, I don't like it and goes back to what he, what he's always had. So there's always this trend, like whether it's with the engine spec or chassis spec, I don't know how many different chassis Yamaha have tried in the last couple of years, like four or five and neither rider has liked them. Um, so yeah, it's a bit worrying. You kind of wonder like, not necessarily how good of a development rider is Fabio, because we don't really know that, but you just wonder if he's already not expecting to have something that works and it's just a predisposition in his head yeah i think i would agree that fabio isn't a particularly good test rider or development rider because i think he has not the emotional stability he has like his highs and lows and he's got not better like, at that but still he yeah is I, a little obviously bit. he he got older but still you know it's still fabio yeah, And um, when you have this frustration over the race weekend to then jump on a new bike and be completely neutral about it is difficult. And mm -hmm. I believe Fabio is younger than me. So, I mean, yeah, yeah, who can fault him? And Frankie did actually test uh, the new chassis. Did he also test the new engine? No, he didn't test the engine. No. Didn't I he? Thought, I thought he did, but I, I asked him and he went, no, nah, didn't do it. <laughs> so. Didn't he want it or didn't Yamaha want it? I'm uh, not sure. Not sure. Okay, because I was thinking about it after when you said when you elaborated on Fabio and his feeling, I was thinking about it if Frankie tested it and because Frankie's obviously leaving, but then what has Yamaha to lose? There's nothing Frankie can take from Yamaha and present Ducati like, hey, they have this new engine. Yeah, yeah. Like this and then like yeah. Ducati will laugh at him if they do if he does it. <laughs> it's, and especially it's like a V4 to an inline four, so there's nothing Yamaha has to lose to give Frankie the new bike and let him test it. Exactly. So um, yeah, I was curious about this. And uh, also regarding uh, Yamaha, I think they need a satellite team so badly. They need somebody like Andrea Dovizioso or like Jean Zacco who can has the experience and can actually develop a bike and give data because all the data they have is basically Fabio at the moment. Like, yes, they have Frankie, but yeah. with Frankie being out the door, I don't know how much in, he'll be involved into the development. So basically everything revolves about Fabio for two or three years and shit is hitting the fan with Yamaha. They are incapable of providing any aerodynamics that Fabio wants or likes or provides any factual uh, advantage. Like, yes, you can have the bigger arrow, but then all of a sudden your qualifying pace is gone. Yeah. And 
then you go back to the 2019 era or whatsoever. So it's not necessarily a good situation with Yamaha. And I think they really need a satellite team to develop stuff with experienced riders on and also take a little bit of the pressure of Fabio because Fabio is an exceptional rider, but he isn't necessarily the best test riders. And all the test riders aren't necessarily the best development riders. Like yeah. the Danny Pedrosa scenario is very rare. Yeah, it is. Um, I yeah, I agree with you that they need a satellite team ASAP. They they needed it bloody last year. Um, but you know the yeah, as we say with the with the Yamaha, obviously if they have that satellite team, then two more bikes double the data instantly. Um, it's very very tricky when you're obviously trying to play that game against you know KTM have four bikes, but then they have Danny Pedrosa, as you say, who's a very very good test rider and also still incredibly fast so his data is extremely relevant a lot of people are also quick to highlight about you know you look at other test riders maybe like Silvan Gintoli who is test rider for Suzuki and how well Suzuki did and Silvan Gintoli is not a Danny Pedrosa he's certainly not slow but he's running at you know maybe a second to yeah roughly a second off what the factory riders would have done um so it's kind of like, okay, you know, from the face of it, is it as valuable as what the data Danny Pedroza will be providing for KTM is? But again, it's just how you use your test rider. Um, the one good thing with Yamaha this year is it seems like they are using Cal Crutchlow more and using them in a better way. They're doing a lot of tests out in Japan uh, with Japanese engineers. Um, so closer to the factory, they can work quicker with the factory, all this sort of stuff. So that's positive. And also him, getting him to do another wild card is great because as Danny said, like I can do a million laps on a test track on my own, but I don't understand how the bike truly behaves in a race situation until I'm there. So, yeah. you know, massive, massively valuable piece of piece of information. Um, one thing we should talk about is Alex Rinzo because he will come obviously into Yamaha next year with valuable experience to Suzuki, which he did very well on. Obviously, Honda has been a difficult year this year, but Alex has done very well on that Honda. And obviously, the highlight of that was that victory in Kota. Very natural rider, one that gets on a bike and can ride around problems, um, but also will have that experience that Fabio doesn't have off of motorcycles. Yeah, I'm actually very interested in that, but still, they need a satellite team. On yeah. top of that and they I also agree. have like a big gap to make up it's not like they have a competitive bike no they have a three years of development apparently uh which they have to make up in one way or another and ktm has multiple test riders i mean jonas volker was testing for them in malaysia then they have yeah. danny pedrosa i don't know uh, how many test riders they also have so maybe that could be a solution to have multiple test riders i mean there is this situation of Danny Pedrosa, but that's like one in a billion. You don't find another Danny Pedrosa yeah. uh, to test your bike. And exactly. then you have somebody like Silvan Gutoli, who's not contracted to Suzuki anymore. And yeah, I mean, you have, you have to have a good test rider who also fits to your the needs of your championship riders. I mean, it, yes. it's not necessarily a benefit to have a good test rider if he has a totally different riding style than Fabio for, or Alex Rins have. So that's also something you have to really work on. And I've heard that uh, that's apparently a problem with Honda, that Honda went away from a test rider who has a very similar style to Mark. And then uh, with Stefan Bradl, apparently there is something... Um, not working correctly with Stefan Bradl, obviously. So he's slow and stupid. So. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't do bad at the weekend, I thought. Yeah, he his did, qualifying did, was good. good. Yeah, he actually did well when he replaced Mark when you compared him to the other Honda riders. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah, yeah. But I don't think he's a good test rider. That's basically my point because the results aren't necessarily in his favor. And uh, I think Honda should definitely think about hiring somebody else. And also mm. Yamaha should definitely think about, not that Cal Crutchlow is bad, but hiring somebody else additionally to Cal Crutchlow. Is there a limitation on how many test riders you can have or how many tests you can even do with your test riders? Like uh, in Japan, for example? 
is there a limitation? I, I think they have a, a number of tests they're allowed to do, yes. Uh, okay. It's certainly a lot more than you're allowed to do with the official riders, but I think there is a number, but I, I'm not too familiar, to be honest. Uh, in terms of number of test riders, I don't know. Uh, it's never something I've, I've looked up, but I could definitely look into it. Um, but as you say about Carl Crutchlow, yeah, it'd be great if they had someone alongside Cal to also test. I know they do a little bit of testing with Japanese riders, um but yeah cal in himself is a fantastic test rider you would presume because for one like uh every bike he rode in his gp career he went well on and he's also rode varying different bikes he rode the yamaha well he rode the ducati well when it was first developing he did okay yeah he his, his year wasn't amazing but i think he did all right for where that bike was uh and then on the honda he was one of the few that really had success on it, apart from Mark and Danny. Um, so yeah, he's a very, very valuable test rider. Yeah. Do you know how many Suzuki engineers went over to Yamaha? I don't know. Not sure. Because this would have been the golden opportunity for Yamaha to fix all of their issues, to just hire the Suzuki engineers, put their bike in the bin, say, build me a Suzuki, and then uh, go well, for it. I mean, who they should have really gone after was Ken Koichi, who obviously, of course, went to Yamaha, uh, to Honda, sorry. Um, obviously, Ken was the technical lead. I guess that's his role, but he was at Suzuki, and now he's in the same or a similar role at Honda. Um, obviously, Ken's an engineer, so he has knowledge of varying different motorcycles, but he had relevant in the now knowledge of an inline four, which is what Yamaha desperately yeah. need to develop so do you know why i love him <laughs> is it because he of the came... clipboard <laughs> no, no 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 he came into honda as the new guy went to the eight times world champion says fuck you you will ride this bike without wings even though we have no business of riding without wings <laughs> and then mark had to do what he was told <laughs> and i don't know what the point was i just love that there was no wings on the bike because they try to figure out what the fundamental problems of the bike were, but the yeah. bike behaves fundamentally differently with the wings on. So I don't get really what they were trying to achieve there, but I fucking loved it that he said, fuck you, you will do what I told you, uh, what I tell you. And uh, you won't ride without wings today. <laughs> and Mark was pissed in Misano, in Malaysia back then. Yeah, he, he did. He definitely had a couple of days there where he was not enjoying his testing program for sure. I, th I think actually that whole saga with varying degrees of aero, that was more like Honda really being like, okay, we actually need to fundamentally understand how each aero piece affects the, how the bike behaves. So, But it was hilarious, especially him coming in as the new guy and doing that. Like, yeah. If he so, was there for 10 years, it would have been different. But him coming in as the new guy and telling the most successful rider right. in Honda history, like, dude, you do this now, is hilarious. Don't mess and with Ken. <laughs> I also, coming back to Yamaha, I also think Lynn Jarvis's time is over. I think Yamaha needs a different perspective, like Honda with Calyx, like a different point of view to a problem which isn't going to be solved with what they're doing today. Yeah, I mean, the trouble with Lin is that Lin isn't uh, involved with the technical side, should we say. Of course, he's like the team, he's the face of the team. He's, he's Everyone knows Yamaha as Lin Jarvis. Um, but from the technical side, that won't be Lin. Uh, obviously, then we can go into other things about like how the Maverick Vinales saga all went down and ended, um, whether that is more Lin's remit and how that was all handled. But uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's a whole web of stuff we could dive into i mean the thing the team works somehow together with the factory and if one or the other is badly managed then the other can do as well as they want to and so yeah. they won't be successful and i think it's time i mean how long is lynn jarvis at yamaha i mean he was long there when Vale was riding like when did he came to yamaha in the late 2000s i believe so i uh, know early 2000s um, no, I mean him as team principal. It was then they had Davide Brivio for a period of time. Yes, they would have. Yeah, Brivio. And was I the think one that after this one, Yamaha. yeah. 
So um, mid mid 2000s, late 2000s, him as team principal, but he was yeah. working for Yamaha previously. Yes. Right? Yeah. So I think it sh could be time to have like a new perspective on how things are run within the team. And maybe this helps the development side as well. What do you yeah. have to do? That's the, that's another thing. What do you have? It can't go worse. <laughs> yeah, but there is always that. Yeah. Uh, hopefully it can only get better. Um, yeah, I mean, of course it's all intertwined and it's all one massive ecosystem, isn't it? Uh, obviously there's always that kind of question of like how much impact can one man have? Um, but as we've seen in other things, Gigi Delinia had a huge impact at Ducati, changed the working, made them change the whole structure, not just technical structure. Um, so yeah, for sure. There's a debate to be had there about whether the same thing needs to happen with Lynn, but then it's only two seasons ago when they were world champions. Um, so it's I, like how how quickly can you say, ah, oh, shit, he's he's useless or he needs replacing. I don't want to call this world championship a fluke because there are no flukes in MotoGP. Jean Mir's championship wasn't a fluke. He was the best rider there. Yeah. But this was Fabio winning the world championship, not Yamaha. I mean, he should not have been there, and it, it was only because of Fabio's greatness that he won this world championship this season. I mean, and yeah. you could also see at the end of the season that Ducati is starting to click, and Yamaha is going. It's like what like was like at the half past point of the season where you saw the trajectory of Yamaha going down and Ducati going up and then kind of Peko had his usual crashings, which helped Fabio this season a lot, like Mugello, like uh, Misano and probably a lot more. I can't, re I can't remember. I thought about Germany, but that was uh, 22, but mm -hmm. yeah, Peko's crashing all the time. That's normal. So, um, yeah, I don't want to say anything bad about this World Championship because Fabio deserved it, but yeah, yeah. it wasn't necessarily Yamaha who won this World Championship with the best yeah. bike. It was the rider who made the best out of it and was like the perfect time where Ducati wasn't clicking at 100% and Fabio took all the advantage out of it and won the World Championship. So yeah, 100% credit for Fabio for pulling it off. But Yamaha was kind of carried by Fabio and not vice versa. Yeah. No, definitely. It's it's a valid point for sure. From the outside, it, it was definitely Fabio that was doing the bulk of the work. Yeah. And back then when the Yamaha was more his type of bike, mm -hmm. like then, but yeah, that's, that's a totally different speculation, but <laughs> I'm very interested. Do you think Honda and Yamaha will get concessions next year? Uh, we'll see. Um, Obviously, the rumors are, are saying that it looks like they might, but uh, there's some uh, opposition from particularly KTM, I believe. Um, I, I mean, it's in the championship's interest that they do get concessions because, you know, Merch GP has to have Honda and Yamaha competitive. And also for the spectacle, like, you know, people calling it Ducati GP and whatever. I mean, if you look at the last handful of races, I mean, obviously, Mizano is not a great test, but... Um, from before that, like, okay, Pekka was doing incredibly well and also Jorge Martin when he's on to winning races, but right behind them are the KTMs and the Aprilias. So, um, yeah, but I I hope that they do. Um, but I think they have to be careful with how they apply them. I read some news that KTM has a veto to say, no, you're not getting concessions. And... Dorna is now trying to overrule KTM and giving them like uh, two slabs one after another, like you can't have six bikes. And my understanding of it uh, is that Dorna simply doesn't want the financial commitment to another satellite team because they have to pay the satellite team a certain amount of money and um, to make it work and they don't have to do it with a factory bike so my understanding is that they only want factories because they don't want to financially support another satellite team mm 
So that's the first uh, slap into the face for KTM. And the second one is, yeah, you technically have the right to say no, but we are going to overrule you because we can. <laughs> and Honda and Yamaha are still getting concessions. So yeah, um, that's like my understanding of things that are going on based on various news articles who are open to the public. You may have to be able to... Uh, click Google Translate to read some of those. I read <laughs> some on Italian uh, news pages and some on German, some on English. So yeah, but it's out there. You can find yeah. it. So um, I'm very interested if they actually get concessions. And if so, it would be huge for your Honda and Yamaha because as we mentioned, like Honda with their rear grip issues, Yamaha with their rear grip and top speed issues, it will help them massively if they can test more yeah. And if they can develop the engine more, and is it still that they have more fuel to burn? Uh, well, uh, with the concessions, oh, I can't remember what the the, the outline is for the concessions because it's been that long since anyone had them. Uh, yeah, Aprilia had them in twenty two. They, they had them up until the end of twenty two, but yeah. after their. They lost them like pretty early, didn't they? In twenty two. Yeah, in Argentina when uh yeah. but they still had them for the rest of the season, right? Uh yes, I believe so. Or was it close or was it 21? after? twenty one? Like, no, it was, was twenty it was twenty two. Twenty two where LH won in Argentina. But yes. I, d I don't know if they said you have the concessions up until Argentina, which was the second race of the season, and after that, since you won your uh con concessions run out. Or if it's then from 2023 onwards, like the 22 season, where you yeah. won a race, yes, uh, you can still have the concessions, but next year you can't. I don't know how the rules are phrased there. Uh, I Do believe you know? it was a seasonal basis. So, like, it doesn't matter if they won okay. at the start of the year, they had the concessions for that year. Okay. I think. Yeah. And, uh, then with the new fuel regulations coming mm -hmm. in in 2024, I believe, mm -hmm. where they have how many percent sustainable fuel? It's 40% next year 40. and then 100% in 27. Okay, so 40% there. I don't know if they actually increase the amount of fuel you can burn then for next year. Uh, nothing's been said on that. I imagine it will be okay. the same because apparently uh, the fuels have been developing are like incredibly similar to okay what we we use now in terms of like power output and <clears throat> and, and economy and stuff like that okay and uh so in, right now uh, my understanding is that it's 22 liters per race right yeah i believe so yeah, yeah. so if that doesn't change and if let's say honor and yamaha are able to burn 24 because i believe this was the old rule back then it was but it, i don't think they would do that now um yeah. I think giving that extra two liters would make too much of a difference. Yeah, but they still would have to rewrite the concession uh, rules anyways, because from the old standpoint, you yeah. couldn't give Honda and Yamaha concessions. Yes. So you, they have to rewrite it anyways and find a solution where they can uh, give Honda and Yamaha the benefits they need, but without... Um, giving them too much yeah giving them too much and basically the thing is ktm and uh, aprilia more or less came or like aprilia suzuki and ktm came into an existing MotoGP gp rule set with the engine mm -hmm. and developed their way with the concessions into one uh into what they are now and yamaha and honda in this rule set fucked up and uh slipped down the the order so um yeah, I don't know how this uh, thing works out, but I'm very interested to see. Yeah, we'll see. I, I think, like, as as you say, kind of, you know, they'll obviously be wanting to give them something, but they, they, you know, they can't give them too much. So it'll be, I think they'll help them in some ways. Like, the biggest thing will obviously be engine development. Um, yeah. But, again, we don't know if it's actually going to happen or not yet. I just need to plug my laptop in one second. Yeah, no problem. It's going to die. Yeah, back with a, a laptop, which is on the charger, so we don't run out of battery. And the last thing I would like to discuss with you is Ducati, because Ducati has an injured Pekumanyaya who didn't participate on the test. 
injured Marco Bezzecchi, who didn't participate on the test, and injured Enea Bastianini, who didn't participate on the test, Joan Sarko, who's leaving for Honda, so you don't necessarily want to give him all the new information because it's like the flip side of what we discussed with Yamaha. Ducati has everything to lose and Honda has everything to gain. So you don't want to give Juan Zaku like more new information, I would presume, which he can take to Honda then. So what did Ducati and especially then Jorge Martin, who's the only one left, actually test in Misano? Um I actually didn't see much. Uh, Crayfar said that he saw a chassis down there, uh, like a variation of something that Ducati had been working on the last couple of seasons, actually, like for a long, long time. They've been working on this fairly different experimental chassis, and Simon said he thought he saw a, an updated one of that. Um, I didn't see it because I spent a lot of time up the other end of pit lane because, you know, Ducati, Pekka wasn't there, and A wasn't there, Bezeki wasn't there. There wasn't really too much to see. Um. So yeah, as far as we know, that's pretty much it. That's essentially all all Ducati tested. Um, I can't remember off the top of my head if they did try a twenty four engine with Martin or anything, but um, knowing Ducati, it, it could have been possible that they did, but maybe not quite this early yet. So really, from Ducati, as you say, with all their star riders out, and it's not exactly like they need the testing time anyway. Uh, there wasn't too much there. Yeah, but then again, if you sleep on the competition, then yes, yeah, 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 they can catch up. But especially if KTM and the whole carbon fiber chassis works out, and they have somebody like Pedro on a factory bike, yeah. it's good night, Irene. If Ducati doesn't isn't careful, yeah, definitely. Like you could make an argument that Pedro is like the best talent coming to MotoGP since Marc Marquez. And if you give Marc Marquez a bike, which is 95% or 98% of a, the top bike, He'll he can make up this gap. And I think yeah. theoretically, Pedro should do the same. So uh, I'm very interested to see it. And do you think with the test, what you saw that KTM and Aprilia closed the gap on on uh, Ducati? Um, tricky to tell because at tests it's always a little bit odd, like as, as you'll already know, with <clears throat> all the Michelin rubber laid down and it makes it extremely grippy and track conditions that they don't really get anywhere else during the whole season. Uh, I can definitely say that in at least in the last handful of races, Aprilia and KTM have closed the gap for sure, especially KTM. Uh, Brad has definitely made a step within himself. He's riding more consistent. He's getting the best out of himself more often. And he's improving his qualifying, which has always been his weak point. Um, and then with this carbon chassis, if he does come, uh, go on to use it, or even the new steel one, and it is a little bit better, like they're already kind of snapping at their heels. So if he finds another step, he's going to be right there with them. Yeah. And do you know what Jack Miller's problems are at the moment? Uh, Jack <clears throat> Jack said he was struggling with the front end feel um, for the last couple of rounds, and particularly okay. in Mizano. Uh, I think probably what Jack was struggling with was maybe, particularly in Mizano, was the high grip with the rear, because Jack a lot of times will really hang the, the rear end out and get it to break out on the brakes. Brad does the same for sure, but it seems as though Brad found a way to overcome it. Um, and yeah, Jack was just struggling with the front end. He said that it just he doesn't have the same feeling as what he had at the start of the year. And do you think that with the KTM situation at the moment with Paul, Augusto and Jack Miller both Oh, all three are potentially at danger of losing their job when all three are saying they have a contract for next season. Um, do you do you have anything new, or do you know anything, or what's what's it, your it feelings? Is, well, I've I have a very clear cut opinion on it. Um, I don't know anything, by the way. I have no idea. Like the same as all everyone watching. Um, but my opinion is. The real prize that 
KTM slash Gas Gas slash the Pyramid Mobility Group has is Pedro Acosta. Um, as much as I like Augusto Fernandez, I do not think he is this golden prize that they should hold on to and you know take him all the way in Mergy Peak because I don't think he's going to go all the way in Mergy Peak. I don't think he'll end up being a race winner or a, or a world champion. Uh, I think even in the first couple of races that Paul's come back, he's shown at times that he's quite clearly much quicker than Augusto. Obviously, it's Augusto's debut season, his rookie season. Like For sure, next year, if he is still there, he will be better. But I just don't see a massive ceiling for him to improve. The reason why I think it's a real clear-cut decision, and I think what they should do is, unfortunately and quite harshly, say bye to Augusto and keep Paul. Um, is because in Pedro's initial stages when he comes up, who is the rider he would learn most off in those first really important first three, four tests and first couple of races? It's going to be Paul. If he is in that Gas Gas team and he is teammates with Paul, he has much more potential and much more information to take from Paul than he does Augusto. Um, and obviously in that scenario, like... KTM have chance to gain a test rider in Paul Spargo. I doubt Augusto would like to be a test rider if he doesn't get this deal. I imagine he'll find something in even Moto 2 or somewhere else. Um, so unfortunately, you would lose out on the possibility of that. But it's not like KTM need a test rider. Uh, so for me, it's, it's clear cut. Your real prize is Pedro. And like my mates here in, in Dorna, have said to me, yeah, but it doesn't matter. Like Pedro's going to succeed on his own anyway. Yeah, but it doesn't hurt to go the extra mile and give him every necessary piece of information at all that he needs to be brilliant. So for me, it's clear you go with Paul, and yeah. unfortunately, say bye to Augusto. I have a very different opinion on it. Um, <laughs> we, first we, of all, we differed on the beer and rinse thing as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, that's correct. I remember. Um, I would just want to say because I'm petty that this season if I feel like it proves me right in this discussion yeah yeah go for it <laughs> and uh, because the Rins won a race so <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah I have a very different perspective first of all the personal one I mean Paul has had a horrific crash in mm -hmm. Pokemon now Yeah. It reminded me too much of Louis Salom, and he was very, very lucky there. And he has a family, has 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 had a wonderful time in MotoGP. He won a world championship. If I was him, I would walk away. Because that's just my personal opinion. But then again, yeah. I'm not a motorcycle racer, and <clears throat> Paul is a hardhead. So he, in my opinion, he wants to prove that Honda's the problem. And... I think everybody knows Honda was the problem. You don't have to prove this. Honda is proving this by themselves now. But um, yeah, apparently Paul wants to stay there. Okay, let's work with the facts. And um, my opinion is that Pedro Acosta and Remy Gardner are very, very close friends. They spent the summer together on the boat. Uh, you saw maybe the Instagram uh, pages I um, know Remy well enough to uh, know that he doesn't think too much of Hervé Porcheral and um, Tech 3 because of his experiences there. And um, I would presume they talked about it and Remy basically said don't. And um, also I think Pedro Acosta wants the factory seat. He has every right to uh, to go to KGM and say, hey, I want this factory seat. So basically what I would do is give Pedro the best platform to succeed because we agree that it's uh, their golden goose. I mean, KTM has everything to gain with Pedro Acosta because uh, he can win multiple world championships. He's that good. And put him in the factory team alongside Brad Binder. He will learn from Brett Binder as much as he can learn from Paul Espargaro. Yeah, He has the best platform to succeed because Tech 3 is chaotic. And I would put like Tech 3 into, uh, I would make them into a development team. Like 
put Paul Espargaro and Jack Miller there because also from a business perspective, I can't see MotoGP losing two Australian uh, riders in a span of two years. That would, I don't think it would ruin MotoGP in Australia, but it would significantly hurt the Australian market. And I think Dorna has a significant interest in the Australian market. And it's important for Dorna uh, to have an Australian rider on the grid. So I think uh, Pedro and Brad factory team and um, Augusto to move out of there, maybe onto a Grisini seat, who knows, if Mark stays at Honda, and uh, put then Paul and Jack there as some kind of a development team, give them their, um, give them their 2024 bikes then, and have them developing the bike and have Brad and Pedro winning races and world championships. That's what I would do. I mean, it's, it's a good way to do it, for sure. Yeah. Um, the obviously the big question is whether Jack Miller's seat is up for changing hands, um, and you never know. Like it, it, it might well be. Pedro Costa, as you say, is the biggest talent to come into MotoGP since Mark Marquez. Mark Marquez came into MotoGP in a factory seat, so why should KTM not do the same with Pedro Costa? Of course, they will say, "Ah, oh, but Gas Gas is a factory seat," but technically, it's not. Um, you know, so. Yeah, it's it's absolutely a, a plausible plan. It's just <laughs> we need to see what happens after the discussions in in KTM. Also, it's very strange to me that there have been no official announcement, which suggests to me that there is still a lot up for negotiation between those five riders and KTM, and what to do, because you can't fit five into uh, four there have been rumors about jack miller being offered double the salary and 10 wild cards or whatsoever um but ktm has come out and said those rumors are wrong so yeah. <clears throat> um, yeah. but there's no smoke without fire and i think that uh i mean to put it differently i put uh my, one of my recent memes i put um Jack Miller sleeping in the box and um, Pedro running away with those uh, with the factory seat, and he liked this. So this is as much confirmation as I need <laughs> for that this shit is going on at the moment. <laughs> so uh, yeah, well we'll see. We'll see if you've predicted the future. <laughs> I don't know, but I just have a gut feeling. Remy and Pedro uh, together that they have talked about Tech 3. Yeah. I uh, have the impression that Pedro doesn't want to uh, be in a satellite team. Like all motorcycle races, they have a big ego and he as well and every ride to him because he has actually put in the results so everybody can acknowledge him as the next best thing. And uh, I think if you are KTM, you're giving him the best platform to succeed. And obviously, the best platform is the factory team. Because since Miguel Oliveira, Tech 3 hasn't had any success except Augusto Fernandez P4 in, in, uh, in the mall. Yeah. So that's my opinion on the whole take. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, it's valid. I, I think, again, like it's it's the same situation with the market, yeah. isn't it? Like there's so many... <clears throat> explanations for doing it this way that way whatever yeah. so and i mean it's harsh to jack because again like with remy uh it's harsh to judge somebody on half a season especially on a new bike where remy was coming up from motor 2 and also the ktm last year wasn't the bike to be on especially the tech 3 one and uh, now to judge jack miller on half a season where he actually did better than most people including me expected and to say okay you're not good enough because you had a stretch of three or four bad races when you come from a ducati to a ktm who are incredibly different and um but it's a rough business and i agree with you that augusto fernandez isn't the one to keep in this equation sadly and I think KTM has so much value in Paul and Jack as development riders and so much value in Brad and Pedro as their superstar riders. And um, when they don't uh, get six, bike, then six bikes, then this is the natural way to go. And 
if Mark indeed stays at Honda, that leaves the Grisini seat wide open. I mean, Jake Dixon is rumored, or is officially con confirmed to stay in Moto2, but was rumored to uh, go to Grisini for a long time. Uh, Abolino was. And it's still, again, strange for me that they haven't announced where Frankie is going, which shows me that there is something going up in the background. Because Frankie to Ducati is more or less official because Paolo Chiabatti came out in Silverstone on the broadcast and said, yeah, uh, we would like to have a rider uh, like Frankie. Yeah. And I think it makes total sense for them when they lose Transaco to put somebody in like Frankie, who's not going to challenge for a factory seat, but who has a ton of experience in MotoGP, who has ridden a Honda, who has ridden a Yamaha, and uh, has been exceptionally well when Yamaha was good. Remember, he was one engine blow up away from becoming a world champion in 2020. And, yeah, he was brilliant. Uh, he, in my opinion, he deserved this championship more than John Mir because he actually went out and won races. Uh, yeah. Plural here. <laughs> so uh, I think, but I mean, engine blows up. You can't do anything about yeah, it. Yeah. It is what it is. But um, I think Frank is a high caliber rider, but... I have no clue what's going on with the Ducati seats. And this, again, shows me that there's a lot of um, negotiation in the background where they don't know. If this Mark Marcus domino will fall, like he will stay at Honda, it's, it could be very interesting if Ducati would promote Jack Dixon because it has a huge value for Dorna to have a British rider on the grid. Um, or maybe Tony Abolino, maybe they say, okay, we will pick off uh, Augusto Fernandes because he is better than uh, Abolino and uh, Jackson and Dixon. So um, this could be a possibility and put Frankie into Pramac, but I also could see Mark going into Pramac and uh, Frankie going to Grisini. And I think until this Mark Domino falls that uh, there will be a lot going on uh, behind closed door which we don't see but to me it's very odd that we don't know where pedro is going even though we know he's going to model gp but we don't know to which team yet and to me it's very odd that we don't know what's going on with these two ducati seats even though it's obvious yeah in a way you know yeah, yeah. that is there's still plenty uh to be yeah decided i would say um but i guess we'll just see Hopefully, we, we find out quite soon because it is yeah. it's now getting to the point where they need to make a decision. Yeah, but it's quite interesting. So you work for Donna, but at the end of the day, you don't have more information to those uh, things. No, no, than I'm just I a, a lowly social media editor. I, yeah. I don't, don't have a fucking clue with that stuff. So. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you always have the perception of those guys, those uh, MotoGP guys, they have to know something, but at yeah. the end of the day... I mean, maybe the guys in the paddock more, I don't go to the races that much, but um, maybe the guys that are always in the paddock will know a bit more. But like even, you know, I chat to Crayfire about it and he's the same as me, no yeah. idea. And he's there every day, so... Yeah, I talked with uh, Simon as well. You live together with Jake Appleyard, right? Yeah, I do. Yeah, yeah, so he's all the time in the paddock, and I would assume if he knows something, he would tell yeah. you. But no, Jack just tells me the rumors, and yeah. that's it. Like all the are yeah. rumors, you know. He yeah. has no idea. No one else. Yeah, please greet him for me. I really like the enthusiasm he brings to to the MotoGP. It's quite refreshing. Yeah, he's good. I'll tell and you. Also, I would like to thank you a lot because a uh, little backstory. I asked uh, Simon Crafer for the podcast a couple of weeks ago and I told him, hey, I have a podcast here. Uh, I had writers like Remy on, uh, Joe Kelso on and uh, Zonta and also I told him about the two episodes we did and um, he told me that he reached out to you and asked because he didn't know who I was and he uh, couldn't judge it uh, if it was a good idea or not and he told me that you had a very very uh, only very positive things uh, to say about me and i would thank you from the bottom of my heart for it uh, talk with that simon works. was incredible he's so nice to talk to and all the positive things you said about him are actually true so uh, yeah thank you very much again uh, for doing this again and uh, for Simon, I texted to you a couple of weeks ago after he, Simon told me, but I still wanted to say it personally. 
yeah well my pleasure i mean as i say like it was i've always enjoyed coming on so yeah. when simon asked he was like you know what's the deal is he a good guy and all this sort of stuff like, yeah yeah of course just go for it so yeah, no yeah we wanted we wanted to uh we have like a huge list of q a's uh i mean i asked a couple of people as well but i feel like we covered everything uh the people asked uh so i don't see the need to really uh, do this again and um i mean we did the same with simon and there were loads of questions i mean i have four or five screenshots with those uh, questions. I believe it's like eight or 10 questions per screenshot. So it's a lot. Yeah, a lot. We already were uh, three hours in, so it was <laughs> a lot. <laughs> I mean, you could talk with uh, with uh, Simon for hours. He's yeah, yeah, so yeah. amazing to talk to. He also feeds back a lot, so, you know. Um, and then we thought about, okay, let's do this again at a, um, at a different time and just run through the questions. And I was in Austria and thought about it, but like race weekends are so stressful for everybody, including for me, because we wanted to get out on Sunday early enough to avoid all the traffic. And then on Saturday after the sprint and rookies cup, you just want to go home. You don't, yeah, really, yeah. I was there with my mom. So I just yeah. wanted Long, to have day. some, get back home. Yeah. It was so fucking hot in Austria. I mean, yeah, yeah. Everyone says that Austria, you go there and it's like incredible. a furnace. Because it's just, yeah. it's in the middle of those mountains, isn't it? Yeah. So it just yeah. catches all the sun. I mean, yeah. I was in Jerez last year and it wasn't near as warm as Austria. Jerez this year was warm. The, the Wednesday when we arrived, it was like 36 okay. degrees. Yeah, yeah. Thankfully, the weekend wasn't that bad. Yeah. But yeah, the, the I mean, Wednesday when year, we went down there was crazy. Last year it was hot, but I felt like you could manage the heat a lot better than in Austria. Probably, yeah. I don't, I don't know if Austria like gets any wind coming through the place or not. Like, I also could imagine that it has to do a lot with humidity because when it's hot and there's also a lot of humidity, it feels yeah. a lot more exhausting than when the yeah, air is yeah, yeah. dry and. Uh, Spain is a lot drier than Austria, I would assume. So, uh, yeah, but we were also sitting in the sun the, all the time. I mean, we were at turn three. Oh, yeah, I remember I wanted to ask you something. We were talking about Yamaha and all the acceleration, and I was at turn three in Austria, and it felt like Yamaha don't have a rider device. I mean, <laughs> you could really see... All the bikes, like the KTM's, even the Hondas and Ducati, really squatting down. But with Yamaha, you couldn't really see a difference between like a Moto2 bike or a Moto GP bike. And even with the warm-up laps, you could really see the difference with all the manufacturers. But with Yamaha, it seemed like there were no ride height devices. They do have one, but when you watch the bike, <laughs> <laughs> I can't say that, but <laughs> uh, when you watch the bike, it seems like it drops less than the others, or at least yeah. it's less nice. But I think it's probably because like the others have like quite a thin tail unit piece at the back. So like you, you really see, particularly the KTM, you really see the KTM like, whoom, yeah. like it proper goes. Um, but with the Yamaha, it's uh, yeah, it seems like it drops a bit less. Do you know how those right head devices work? Uh, basically, it's just a small, well, it's a button on the on the lever, and then I think it's all, uh, or at least it's cable at the bottom to to pull to actually like make the the bike drop. They do it by extending one part of the linkage, so the the rear linkage which connects onto the bottom of the suspension and the swing arm. Essentially, there's one part of that which is like a little rod, and they've done it so that now there's a, like a hydraulic canister on there. Uh, and it extends the arm and it just pushes this part of the linkage further away. And what that does is it like moves the base of the swing arm out essentially. Um, and so then it looks like it causes the bike to drop. So do they uh, push the oil out of the suspension and therefore no. where? Not, no. So they, they don't push like any oil out of the suspension. Okay. For the rear, it's it's purely done with on the linkage. They don't actually touch the touch the rear shock itself. Oh, okay. So it's just like a little gas canister, like oh, um, not gas canister, hydraulic canister thing. Um, oh, okay. And it's just like a small rod that extends, and then it causes the the bike to look like it drops. Because I always uh, thought they were playing with the uh, pressure inside the 
inside the suspension. So to basically take out the, the fluid of the suspension. So therefore it just compresses and they block it. And when they release it, that they push it or allow the fluid to go back in. That's what my theory was all the time. I mean, yeah, yeah. Like it, technically, I guess it could work, but I think to make that work, you'd have to move quite a big yeah. volume of liquid, like yeah. in a flash. Yeah. That would be very, very difficult to do. Okay, so yeah, basically that's uh, what I forgot about. So yeah, thank you very much uh, for doing this again, and hopefully no we'll see each other uh, after the Valencia test again. Yeah, are you, you going to go to any races this year? Well, I know they're all um, flyaways now, but no, go to Valencia. No. No, I mean, I was in Valencia in 2021 and it was exceptional. Uh, I really liked the track. We were sitting between turn two and turn six, so you could mm -hmm. see the whole track. Yeah, it was yeah. nice. Great point. And especially with Remy back then fighting for the championship, we saw all three championships. Uh, I went to Misano with my mom because we always wanted to go to Mugello and it never really worked out. Then COVID came because like then I was old enough to to drive and to uh to be like with her and um not be too dependent like as a child for example so um yeah we never managed to do Mugello and then this um this race in Misano all of a sudden came because I believe they canceled Thailand and um then I said to her hey Tickets are dropping, let's go. And she said, okay. And then we flew to uh, Misano, came back home. And with my girlfriend, I made the double header at Portugal and Valencia. And uh, we saw all championships uh, unfold, which is nice. And I'm proud to say I watched Mark's la last victory live. So, oh, yeah, um, yeah, true. Yeah. 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 And um, it was actually very, very entertaining. But Back then, it was before the war in the Ukraine started, all the accommodation flights, it was so cheap. I mean, we yeah, flew yeah. to Portugal to Spain for a couple of euros. It wasn't too expensive. And now it's so fucking expensive. You have to pay like 250, 300 for oh, one really? flight. Shit. Yeah, it's crazy. And uh, then again, I'm at a point at the moment where I... I already know how it is to experience a race live and the thrill is a little bit gone because I, I attended Assen three times, uh, 14, 19 and 22. I attended, uh, Portugal, Jerez and Misano, and then Austria in 2021, those two races, I would count them as one in 22 and 23 Austria. And basically I didn't want to go to Austria, but uh, I got tickets gifted to, so I ah, just class. went. Nice. So yeah, that's the whole reason behind it. But uh, I don't think I will go to a race uh, this season anymore. And I really fell in love with World Superbike races because it's such a nice environment to be in. Nobody gives a shit. You can just walk through the paddock and see riders and like Remy, he uh, said to us, hey, come to the box. And then he showed us the bikes, like things that wouldn't be possible in MotoGP. And it's such an amazing experience for fans that I would rather go to a World Superbike race now. I went to Most, I went to Assen, and I would really like to go to more races, uh, especially like next season when we can plan a little bit better. So, um, yeah, I can really recommend World Superbike and... Yeah, with MotoGP races, I don't, I don't think I'm done with it. But for the moment, I experienced it and everything is fine. I would like to go to Phillip Island or something like this. Yeah, that would be cool. Yeah, yeah. one was, of those proper bucket yeah. as well. Yeah, I, I always have a dream. Uh, always had a dream of training Muay Thai in Thailand. Um, I just, I'm just reminded of uh, how much of a fucking pussy I am because uh, two days ago in sparring. I uh, hit a dude and my right knuckle here, the, yeah, yeah. the, the second and the last one from the right hand side, they hurt like motherfuckers because through my glove, I just hit him in the temple and he was moving forward quite a lot. So it hit 
and I felt sorry for it because I wasn't uh, meant to hit so hard, but since <laughs> he moved forward, it was quite hard. And now my fucking knuckles hurt so much. <laughs> and those guys are riding with broken hands and can't even walk. And I'm bitching about uh, my knuckles hurting a little bit. <laughs> well, you'll be all right. You'll be fine. <laughs> yeah. Don't worry. No, but um, yeah, my dream was always to go to Thailand to train there with the Thais and then maybe go to, uh, to Buriram. This would be nice. Yeah, yeah. But, would yeah be a cool with European one. races, I'm more or less done. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Quick story time with me. <laughs> <laughs> you okay, need to do I'll... Le Mans, actually. That's one yeah. you should do, eh? Yeah. That's, that's actually correct. I've never been to Le Mans, and it's not too far away. It's like a seven hour drive or something from where my mom lives. And yeah, yeah. Yeah. But yeah. Um, since I'm moving to Berlin now, uh, if you ever happen to be there, hit me up. Yeah, we'll and... do. Definitely. Yeah, hopefully I get to go to Saxony or something next year. I don't know yeah. if Saxony is near Berlin or not. I've never been. So it's quite near. I mean, you have um, you have the whole eastern Germany, like the where back and up until the nineties was this border between mm -hmm. Western and Eastern Germany. And Berlin is more or less in the middle of it. And the Saxon yeah. ring is more towards the south uh, into the direction of like Polish and Czech border. I believe. Oh, yeah. okay. I'm not quite sure, but it's, it's not too far away. Maybe I could do it as well, but I don't, I don't like the Saxon ring. I think this track <laughs> is fucking ugly. <laughs> I mean, I mean, what yeah, the fuck? I, I'm not a big fan of the track. I like, it's very unique, isn't it? But yeah. Uh, it, it's meant to be a good one to go to if you're a fan. Yeah. Like, oh. yeah, yeah. Apparently, like around the circuit, there's a lot put on. It's a good party. So nice. Mm. Yeah. I'm, I'm a fucking boring human being. I don't <laughs> go to parties. I chill at home with my animals. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, play with the dogs, play with the cats, go to the stable with my girlfriend and go to bed early. Then I'll, I go to training a couple of times a week and, uh, stand and bang with some random dudes <laughs> <laughs> hurt my fucking knuckles and that's basically my life so well there, there are worse ways to live so i won't, yeah. won't complain too much yeah. get some cte and make stupid memes <laughs> <laughs> okay thank you very much and uh goodbye thanks for having me on cheers